Film Radio, this is Nicola Comotti here, the 74th edition of the Venice Film Festival, and today I'm joined by Lucian Castantello. Is that correct, Lucian? Sure. Almost. <laughs> let's, say, let's hear from you. Lucian Taylor. Okay. Verena Paravel. There you go. I wash my, you know, any responsibility uh, off, of my, yeah. off of my voice. <laughs> um, the topic is your latest uh, feature called Caniba. I had uh, the privilege of watching it yesterday. Uh, I use the word privilege mainly because of the incredible outcome that this film is, although it was, of course, a demanding watch, and I had to be inside the mind of a person that usually you're not acquainted with, or anyway, the, the fantasies and the, the visceral uh, drives that this person has. We're talking about Issei, yeah, Issei uh, Isagawa, which was a very famous case of cannibalism and through, let's call it, uh, the sort of uh, weird legal clauses, actually this man is free. And uh, this is the very first, I think, the most sincere kind of uh, uh, document that we have uh, about this man. Um, I just, I, I'm slightly acquainted with the like, Japanese culture and Japanese customs, and I, um, I was mesmerized by the will of uh, Issei and his brother as well to open up with you. And as a documentary maker, I wonder how long it took actually to get into that kind of intimacy, or maybe actually this man needs to talk about himself. Um, people often ask us this question about all of our films, even though humans often don't loom large. This is the first film where we've really concentrated on a portrait of two people. Um, it seems very easy. Uh, uh, it seems that if if one, if we are open to our subjects, they seem automatically to open up to us. Mm. Um, I think perhaps and perhaps filmmakers go in with more preconceptions than we do, and they try to coerce their subjects into a carapace, not of their own choosing, that is being imposed from the outside. And their subjects, when they sense that, start smarting, and hence introduce a degree of distance. In this case, we went in. We had preconceptions, most of which we were unconscious of, just as all human beings have, but we had no sense of what we wanted the film to be other than an open-ended collaboration with an individual in the first case and later two individuals, the two brothers, but an individual who, as you say, is, had been pre-classified as a monster, um, both in Japan and in the Western Orientalist tradition as this demonic, oriental, wily person uh, feasting off young, white, Western flesh. Um, we also realized that in all of the history of representation of anthropophagy and cannibalism, there is no interest whatsoever, whatsoever in the subjectivity of the cannibal. In, there, there is this uh, vilification, this horripilation of cannibalistic acts, but no curiosity about cannibalistic desire. And obviously cannibalistic desire is part and parcel of the human condition, so we wanted to make a film that was open enough and non-judgmental enough that the spectators could begin to not go in with their um, judgment predetermined, but actually reflect back on themselves reflexively um, about their relationship to these drives that have always been part of the human condition. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm... Um, what well, he said. <laughs> no, no, I was listening and thinking in the same time, and I had nothing to add. I was, you know, this is, this is, this is the, the challenge of this film was exactly to do that. You just like, how can we not be judgmental mm, and try to, you know, to reconnect with. And from maybe Issei's perspective as well, I, that's what I thought. Uh, there was a sort of return to a past or almost like a personal kind of uh, nostalgia, you know, from the friend, you know, you, you guys coming also from France, maybe you also had this sort of like, you know, a memory that comes back, but like you know, a fond, you know, a fond memory that goes back. That was probably my, you know, my idea as well. That's why he felt also kind of like at ease with you guys. Maybe it was just like going back to the past where also he's before the stigma, before, uh, before, you know, is the, the brand that now is carrying with himself. I was I was wondering about that. I mean, when we when we because he has a, obviously a troubled relationship with with the past and and with friends also and and then the first time we met him, I was uh, kind of worried about me being French and how this would play and then so. But he had this beautiful way to go from French to English to Japanese that was like 
part of a kind of a mostly incomprehensible you know communication but this is also the film is also about that about how we misunderstood each other uh, and how even from the past you know Caniba crum come from uh, Christoph, uh, Christopher Columbus going to the Caraiba to Ca Cariba and misheard Cariba, Caniba for Cariba and then this is this whole evocation of this uh, you know uh, uh, imperialist uh, fantasy that everybody else is a cannibal mm -hmm. forgetting that we are actually all uh, cannibal but I'm digressing um, something that really stuck in, uh, in my mind while I was watching is also when we hear it say and talking about uh, movement 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 you know their repetition as well and uh, automatically I thought about this sort of counterpoint with your aesthetic choice of representing his say so uh, I would say almost claustrophobic, static camera, you know, being almost part of Issei's body. You know, we never see the whole body, it's just his face, so always slightly lower as well. The, what, um, what drove you to this kind of uh, choice? Was it, was it something that came um, naturally, or uh, you had it already preconceived, you know, before the shooting, so having this sort of constant close up on him? It's it's it feels like we have mutilated him, right? Because you you're not. I mean, we just go for a couple of interview and everybody uh, uh, ask us this question. I don't know if I have a, like an, an answer. I, I I can just tell you that it was not preconceived because we couldn't. While we were filming, we could not understand what they were saying. Um, but you, as a filmmaker, as a DP, you have a predilection for close-ups. I do. And you're, whenever you film, it's very much the aesthetic, your aesthetic in this film. You, whenever you film, you're an extraordinary person. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that I want to be stuck for my whole life, like being in the face of people. Uh, it, it seems that this is the way that sounds the, the most appropriate to film him. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, people want to see his body. Um, and I don't, I don't know, I, I, maybe like a, I, I could answer later uh, if I think really clearly about it, but I guess if we at the end, if we decided to, for me there is a play with of course like suffocation and all these things, this is how we felt when we were filming, but also um, th th for me it's also the going in and out of focus, like for me it's just the way is also present and absent mm -hmm. with us and the way we are absent and present listening and not understanding and suddenly understanding something or not so we were actually very bored when we were filming because imagine filming uh, i don't know if you understand Rush russian but like filming for hours and hours somebody speaking in a language that you don't understand and then, but it, you, you also, you, you, you can tell that sometimes it's just retrieving into his own universe. And then I think we were playing with this going in and out of, with this absence and our presence and absence. But I don't know if it's enough to, just to justify the way that we, it was a suffocating reclaw. And, and I know that people long for seeing the posture of the women on the... Um, because he lives in a place where he has posture of athlete and women and Walt Disney next to tableau from the Renaissance or it's just like a very interesting mix of things he's surrounded with. But somehow they didn't end up... Because they didn't seem to be motivated the way we filmed them. I think I yeah, agree with everything you said. I think we filmed in a medium shot or in a more classical fashion, be it documentary or fiction. The audience would have interposed or would have sensed a degree of distance. He would have been framed, he would have objectified, so they wouldn't have had this reflexive discomfiture engendered by the yeah. extraordinary proximity, which is a psychophysical proximity that is not linguistic. And as you started the question with talking about movement and movement and movement, and what's interesting, even though this is our first film that privileges talking subjects, 
shot for the most part, if eccentrically as talking heads, is that they don't talk very much. Um, and when they do talk, especially when Issei san talks, it doesn't result in this stream of logical, propositional, sentential discourse. He speaks in haikus, he speaks in fragments. And I think when he expresses himself linguistically, you sense this flux of consciousness uh, in which language itself only occupies a tiny, tiny part. Um, and I think the strength of cinema as an art form is that language is marginalized. Even, even films that privilege language, it's not privileged in the same way that it is in theater or the same way that it is in literature. And um, I think in filming in close-up, this, this forced proximity, you don't have this comfortable moral, ethical distance from your subject, and you're forced to think about your forms of identification and differentiation from the subject in a way that doesn't allow you to let you off the hook as a viewer. And kind of like linked to what you said as well, I, uh, I found really in incredibly effective uh, the use that you had with the footage you know, for the childhood. Because once again, as you said, it's, a, it's sort of like a, it's a participatory, uh, um, participatory uh, experience for the audience. You know, we are part of him for the for the duration of the film. There's no judgment whatsoever. We suffer with him, but it's with. You know, there's a there's a link in between audience and himself. And I thought that maybe when the footage started, I was like, oh, maybe there's a new distance because we are uh, objectifying, you know, the childhood of somebody. But instead, you know, with no voice whatsoever, it's just. It's just little hints of the the inner part of the the issue because as we know now with the film, it also the brother is affected by some sort of desires you know and, and that we would call in a normal society is, um, how do you say ob obscene desires um, but I was just thinking that it was a wonderful way of using footage uh, in a way once again to make us part of him rather than you know as opposed to him uh, I just wondered if once again, this, for example, when you had the footage, it was um, almost a post-production kind of idea that you had afterwards, when you got hold of the footage itself, during the shooting, and then you decided to put it in the middle as a sort of like intermezzo, um, just the kind of the user, once again, as, um, as a filmic, uh, filmic tool to then tell their story. Uh, so it was n the, the idea came obviously after because they they gave they gave those food those uh, film actually the film the role the re real uh, to us and uh, they spent like uh, we spent an afternoon or, or two going through their family album mm -hmm. and they were talking about their childhood their brother their memory and um, and they gave this 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 um, eight millimeters uh, film and there is a 55 minutes or more 70 minutes maybe and when we watched them uh, we were first of all amazed by the the beauty of them uh, kind of Lumiere uh, meet uh, Méliès kind of uh, images sometimes and uh, but we didn't think immediately of how we could we were just fascinated and then having by just watching them we felt in a position that is very strange and also very uncomfortable because you are at once um, pre and post crime or incident as they like to call it and then so this very strange pre post position uh, prevent you to be, uh, comment tu dis, attendri? Sensitized by their cuteness and how cute they are as baby. And then, and then it's just this very interesting, confusing, mixed feeling you're put uh, into that, that's like pushed that also to play we were also interested in using archival footage that we've never done before in our work and say, if we were to do it, how, how can we and where and how we will af affect our relationship to them. And um, so I think that was a super interesting moment in the editing process to, to, to play with this. Uh, you know, in the progression with them, like it, like like the voyage we're doing with them, it's just coming at a moment where 
it comes just after the manga, so you're you're just went through a lot, and then suddenly you're you're, you're going back, you know, in passing memory. So, what, what would you say? I thought it was absolutely fucking brilliant, <laughs> um, and the question was insanely smart too. Uh, no, I have nothing to add. It was amazing. I mean, the danger. <coughs> No, it was extraordinarily brilliant. It really was. The danger that we were aware of was that in using archival for we, we were interested a priori in using archival footage, one of our preconceptions, but it wasn't it was a vague idea, but we never really took it that seriously. When we decided to start introducing them, the danger, of course, is that typically once you use archival footage that are historical, that is not contemporary, then it represents some objective representation of history or of memory, which is completely fictitious and false. And the danger in introducing this moment of archival footage, which is an excerpt from an earlier work that we made where it runs for much longer, it runs for 43 minutes, um, is that it would, it would introduce a very simplistic dyadic binary between there and then, the innocent childhood, mm -hmm. and here and now, the post-lapsarian, post-apocalyptic, post-incident, pathological present. And on the contrary, what we wanted, as you said, was to, uh, to you have this simultaneous movement of wanting to find biographical symptoms or causes of things that will happen later in life, but it's utterly vain, it's impossible, yeah. because, as many, because they're open to an infinity of interpretations, and because there are no singular causal lines of determinism at all. Um, so it's allowed people to encourage, yeah. encourage people to reflect on that, but also the futility of doing that at the same time. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant interview. Thank you Brilliant. so much. <laughs> no, seriously, guys, thank you so much. That was a, that was a honor. And keep making films, please. Fred Film Radio, the Festival Insider.